Campaigns of 1777 is a two-player strategic level war game included with Strategy and Tactics magazine, issue number 316. The game recreates the American War of Independence in the northern colonies during the critical year of 1777. In this game, one player commands the British forces trying to gain control of key ports and cities, while the other player controls the Patriot forces trying to prevent a British victory. Each inch on the map represents about 20 miles, and each strength point about 300 to 500 men, and each turn roughly two weeks of real time. This is a game of medium complexity, and Solitaire's suitability is medium. Let's take a look at the game components. The game includes one 22 by 34 inch map sheet depicting the American colonies north of Pennsylvania and Maryland. The map is divided into spaces connected by lines to regulate movement. The map spaces include cities, countryside spaces, small forts, large forts, and ports. There are various types of connecting lines, such as rural connectors, rough connectors, water connectors, and some which are dual connecting types. The map also contains the charts and tables needed to play the game, such as the turned record track and the leader escape table. There's also a chart specifying the British victory conditions, as well as charts that summarize modifiers for avoiding battle, interceptions, and reinforcing battles. There are summaries also of modifiers that are used to calculate the number of dice rolled during a battle or when storming a fort. There's also a space for holding boxes for each side's leaders as well as for available supply units. The map also includes a track to keep a running tally of activation points remaining and that is used when a leader is conducting his activation. Casualties are also tallied in this track. The sea travel track is used to regulate the movement of British General Howe's army as it sails between both ports. And there are also tables for Patriot and British random events. The map is divided into four departments, which are important for the purpose of rallying militia for the Patriot side, or Tories and Indians to the British side. There are garrison boxes for New York and Montreal, which hold British forces and leaders that are required to stay there unless released by an event. The game includes 228 half-inch counters, showing units representing British and Patriot forces. Each unit counter shows a strength point number printed on the top left corner of the counter. On the British side, there are counters showing strength points of British regulars, Hessians, Tories, Indians, and artillery. On the Patriot side, there are Continentals, Militia, and Artillery. Most of the actions in this game are conducted by units with leaders, and there are two types of leaders, primary leaders and subordinate leaders. Only primary leaders are activated when their respective activation marker is drawn. The information in the leader counter is as follows. The leader's rank is denoted by one, two, or three stars, and this determines the maximum number of strength points, including artillery strength points, with which the leader may march, intercept, avoid, or reinforce a battle with. The range is the number of spaces from which a leader may cause other friendly units to take certain actions. The leadership rating is expressed as a number of leadership points, which, when activated, the leader expends to conduct actions with his army or to activate a subordinate leader within his range. There's also numbers for the leader's attack rating and defense rating, and these are used in battle or when storming a fort. 
subordinate leaders have the same information printed on their counters as primary leaders, with the exception that, instead of a range number, they show an activation cost number encased in a box, and this is the cost in leadership points that the primary leader must spend to activate the subordinate leader within his range. This game uses a chit pool system to activate leaders and units, as well as triggering supply and event checks, and for this purpose, players must supply an opaque cup. There are also markers included with the game, which are used to track various game functions, and these include casualties, activation, sea travel destinations, and markers to denote British control of Philadelphia. The game uses six-sided dice, which the players must supply. Two or more are recommended, and the more, the better. The game includes a 16-page rulebook in full color. Actual rules cover 14 and a half pages, and the remaining page and a half contains information about two short scenarios plus optional rules. The game is won by control of certain spaces. To win, the British player must have gained control of Philadelphia at any time during the game. In addition, the British player at the end of the game must control the following spaces. Montreal, Fort Ticonderoga, Albany, Fort Montgomery, and New York City. And should the British fail to achieve their victory conditions, the Patriots win the game. The game lasts 10 turns from June to October of 1777. Let's take a look at the sequence of play. Each turn consists of the following four phases. The beginning of turn phase starts with the British player rolling dice to rally Tories and Indians, while the Patriot player rolls to determine if a leader will rally militia. Next, the British player may conduct sea travel with Howe's army by advancing his units on the sea travel track one space or by exposing their destination if they begin the phase on the turn two box. In the last step of this phase, any army that is under siege may sortie from the fort and immediately resolve a battle. In the initiative phase, each player rolls two dice adding the result to the number of casualties suffered by his opponent. The high roller gains the initiative, which allows him to determine which primary leader from either side will conduct the first action of the upcoming action phase. All remaining leader activation markers go into the cup, together with supply check and random event markers. The action phase consists of a series of rounds driven by markers drawn from the cup. A primary leader so activated may march with an army, normally one or two spaces, and execute operations, including activating subordinate leaders. If a supply marker for a side is drawn, a supply check is conducted of all that side's units, and units that are found to be out of supply at this time are so marked and suffer the reducing effects of attrition, plus other effects of being out of supply. And these adverse effects last until the next time that the side's supply marker is drawn and the affected units are found to be in supply. If a random event marker for a side is drawn, the player rolls two dice and consults his random events table, implementing the event immediately. The rounds continue to take place until the cup is emptied, and this ends the action phase. In the end of turn phase, players check to see who wins the game if this is the last turn. Otherwise, the turn marker is advanced one space and a new turn begins. So, we're going to take a look at uh, some examples of play. This is the situation at the beginning of the game around New York. The British have concentrated how a significant number of their forces. But our example will uh, take place in uh, upstate New York.
well, upstate now, but before it was an estate. And it has to do with St. Leger's force or army. We're going to follow step by step the example that is in page 8 of the rule book. So if you have the game and you want to follow along, you're welcome. And this example assumes that we are in the first turn of the game and by special rule the British have the initiative in the first turn. And the side with the initiative can pick one activation marker uh, from a leader from any side to go first. So the British select uh, the primary leader, St. Leger, to go first. St. Leger is at Fort Oswego. And uh, let's take a look at uh, the forces that are in that fort space. We can see that St. Leger is the only primary leader in that space. There's a secondary leader, Johnson, who can command any of the forces. And then there's an Indian leader, Brandt, who can only command Indian strength points. There's five British regulars, two Hessians, three Tories, and five Indian strength points. There's one artillery strength point and a supply train. Now St. Leger has a rank denoted by one star. And that means that he can only move with five strength points, including one artillery strength point. So uh, there's much more than that in that space. So uh, it may be a good idea for him to activate subordinate leaders during this activation. So St. Leger will take five British regular strength points, which is the maximum number of strength points he can take. So St. Leger moves across the water connection to Fort Stanwix. That's a small fort that has three continental strength points in a supply train. Now let's see what options the Patriots have. First, we declare and resolve all interceptions. Then we declare all avoid attempts. After that, we declare all reinforce attempts. Then we resolve all reinforce attempts. And lastly, we resolve all avoid attempts. And the Patriots don't have any units adjacent to that space. Fort Dayton is empty, so there are no possible interception attempts. So now the Patriots have to declare whether they will attempt to avoid battle. And uh, they don't have any leaders in Fort Stanwix, so that means they cannot avoid battle into an adjacent space. They have the option, however, of avoiding battle by moving into the fort and that's what they will do and they declare so and now the british have to declare any reinforce attempts they have uh, units adjacent at fort oswego the british will make two attempts to reinforce the battle the first with johnson's army of two hessian and three tory strength points and a supply train and then another attempt will be performed by the Indian leader, Brandt, and five Indian strength points. Let's see the possible modifiers. There's a minus one because he's reinforcing into a space with a friendly army. And that's always going to be the case in reinforce attempts. And there's also a plus two because re he's reinforcing across a water connection. And there's also a minus one because the British have the initiative, so the total modifier is zero. So we roll first for Johnson, and the success of the reinforce action depends on rolling a final die roll that is equal or less than his leadership rating of six. So the British need six or less, and we roll two d6. The result is a 7, and Johnson's reinforce attempt fails. So his army stays put at Fort Oswego for now. And now we roll for Brandt. Notice that for Brandt and his five Indian strength points, the same modifiers apply. So there is no modification. We roll 2d6, and the roll is a 6, which is less than Brandt's leadership rating of 7. So he successfully reinforces the battle. And Brandt's army joins St. Legger's at Fort Stanwix. 
And now we resolve the avoid attempt, which in these cases, when an army is uh, avoiding into a fort, is automatic. So now we continue with St. Legger's activation. He had only moved one space, but he had to stop because there was enemy units in that space. Now it's time to spend some leadership points. And here I'm showing these uh, custom-made cards that I made for the purpose of uh, helping the player decide what particular actions, which involve spending leadership points, he may choose. And you see these cards state the action in the top part, and in the bottom you have the cost in leadership points. And St. Legger has seven leadership points to spend. The British have a total of ten possible actions that involve spending leadership points. We're not going to go through each one of them. Suffice to say, for the purposes of this example, that the British are considering storming the fort. But that consumes the activated leader's entire leadership rating. That would be the seven uh, leadership points of uh, St. Legger. So instead of storming the fort, St. Legger wants to uh, gather more forces before doing that. So he will activate Johnson, who is still at Fort Oswego in his army, and uh, he will use this action, activate subordinates, and the cost is equal to the subordinates activation number. And that is the four that is encased in a white box. So this costs four leadership points for the primary leader, that is St. Legger, to activate the uh, subordinate leader, Johnson. And we make the adjustment on the activation points track. So St. Legger still has three leadership points to spend. Now, once activated, Johnson marches his two Hessian and three Tory strength points and his supply train to Fort Stanwix, where he joins St. Legger's army. So with no more possible actions, and uh, St. Lee Legger cannot move out of this space, that ends his activation. Now, units that are inside a fort prevent enemy units from moving through or out of a fort space into any space that is not closer to the closest supply depot friendly to those enemy units. So by uh, having Patriot units inside the fort and Fort Stanwix, St. Legger is prevented from advancing one more space into Fort Dayton because in that direction is not the direction of his supply source. His direction of supply is uh, in the direction of Fort Oswego. So he could move forces back to Fort Oswego, but he will not do so, and that ends St. Legger's activation. Now, let's say, for example, that in the next turn, St. Legger is activated once again. And he expends his entire leadership rating to storm Fort Stanwix. So now we perform a storm operation in that space. Here we have the forces laid out. The British have 15 strength points, of which five are British regulars, two leaders, and they are in supply. The Patriots have three continental strength points. They're also in supply. Now, let's calculate how many dice each side rolls. And in this game, only sixes inflict a hit on enemy forces. And we consult this part of the storm dice calculation chart that pertains to the storming side. There's one die for each non-artillery, non-Indian strength point. So the British have 10 strength points, which are non-Indian and non-artillery, so we begin with 10 dice. We skip the uh, one for artillery because there's no artillery, but the British now add the attack rating of their senior ranking leader, St. Legger, which is a paltry one, so we're at 11. Plus one for additional leaders, that is Johnson and Brandt, so we're at 13. Plus one, if there's British regular forces present, yes, so now we're at 14. And plus one, because there's a British leader with regular forces, so now we're at 15. 
another plus one because there are Hessian strength points present. We're at 16. There's no Hessian leaders, no ships, and obviously now comes the part where we cut the storming dice in half. So half of 16 is 8, and no other circumstances applies because these units are not out of supply. So the British roll 8 dice. Now we calculate the number of dice to be rolled by the Patriots, which are the storm side. They have three strength points, so uh, these are non-artillery strength points. They start with three dice. Notice that no other circumstance applies. There's no leader, and uh, there's, these are not British regular forces that are being stormed, and there's no Hessians nor Hessian leaders. So now we double the amount of dice. We have three, it's doubled now to six, and no other adjustment is made because these units are in supply. So the British roll eight dice and the Patriots six, and only six is score hits. The British rolled one six and the Patriots two sixes. So here, the British have to remove two strength points and the Patriots one. And the Patriots now have two continental strength points. And now we reduce the British side by two strength points and no particular type of unit can take a second strength point loss until each other has taken one. So the British will take losses, one strength point from the Indians, which now leaves them with four, and the Tories will take one loss also. And they have two strength points left. And because neither side was eliminated, the units of both sides remain in place. So in a future activation, the uh, Patriots uh, may try to bring additional forces to that space, and if they do so, and they move units from out of Fort Stanwix into Fort Stanwix, they will have to battle the British uh, besieging forces. And the British, of course, can try to execute a storm uh, action in a future turn when St. Leger is activated again. But notice that the Patriots have a supply train in Fort Stanwix that keeps their units in supply until this marker is drawn from the cup and then a supply check is made and then the Patriots uh, will have to spend the supply train to stay in supply. That is done by picking the supply train marker and placing it in the available supply unit box. And in this game, new supply units, that is supply depots and supply trains, are brought into the map from that box by conducting this action, place supply, which costs four leadership points. Let's take a look at a combat example here. In this example, Washington is activated, and he starts by marching into Kingston. Now he conducts his second march and moves a, across a water and uh, land connection, a mixed or dual connection, into Hudson. And now we check for any interception attempts and we see that von Neiphausen, a Hessian leader, is in an adjacent space at Stockbridge with seven Hessian strength points, and he will attempt to intercept in order to join Howe. Let's see which modifiers apply, and for this purpose we assume that the Patriots have the initiative. The only one that applies is the minus one into a space with a friendly army. So the Hessians need a final dice roll with 2d6 of 7 or less, and there's a minus 1. We roll 2d6. The die roll is a 9 modified to an 8, and the Hessians come up short, and they are not able to intercept. So Howe is by himself for now. Now Washington will use some leadership points to see if he can reinforce the battle. If you take a look south... We have the forces of Putnam and Sterling, but they're too far away. 
uh, most they could move is two spaces and they will reach Kingston and not be in time to help Washington. However, in Albany, we have Schuyler. Before spending any leadership points from Washington, we can check to see if Schuyler and Herkimer can reinforce this battle. Let's take a look at the applicable modifiers. Minus one applies for reinforcing into a space with a friendly army, and the uh, Patriots have the initiative. That's another minus one for a total of minus two. So we roll first for Schuyler, and uh, his leadership rating is seven, and there's a minus two die roll modifier. The roll is an 11 modified to a 9, so Schuyler fails to reinforce the battle. Now we go with Herkimer. It has a leadership value of 6. We roll 2d6. A 6 modified to a 4, so Herkimer does reinforce the battle. And his army joins Washington's. And now in the declare avoid attempts, the British do not declare any avoid attempts, so Howe stays put. Now Washington will spend leadership points and he will conduct this action, battle planning, and he will do it three times. There's no limit to the number of times it can be used in an activation. Each uh, action costs three leadership points. Washington has nine leadership points. So uh, he can add now three dice to his battle dice resolution. So here we see the forces that will participate in this battle. Washington has a total of 13 strength points, of which seven are continental uh, strength points. And the uh, British have a total of 11 strength points, of which there's six British regulars. Let's take the Patriot side first. One die for every two militia strength points. Uh, they have four, so we start with two dice. And one die for every continental strength point. So we add the seven continental strength points we have there. So we're now at nine. There's also two dice for every attacking artillery strength point. There's two, so that adds four more, and now we're at 13. The attack rating of the senior ranking leader, that's Washington, that's two more, that is 15, and we add one for each additional leader, and it would be Herkimer, so now we're at 16. And we add three dice for the three battle planning actions, by Washington, so it's a total of 19 dice for the Continentals. Now we make the calculation for the British side. There's one die for every two Tory strength points. There's three Tory strength points, so we begin with two dice. And there is one die for every regular strength point. There's six, so now we're at eight. Three dice for each defending artillery point. There's two artillery points, so that's a plus six. Now we're at 14. The defense rating of the senior ranking leader, Howe, has a two, so now we're at 16. And plus one, because there's at least one British regular, we're at 17. And plus one, because there's a British leader with a British regular unit. We're at the British roll, 18 dice. So we roll the Patriot dice first, and we will roll 10 and then 9. And the first 10 dice are rolled, only two sixes, so two hits for now. Now we roll the remaining 9 dice. And one more 6 for a total of 3 hits. The British roll 18 dice, so we will roll 9 first and then the remaining 9. And in the first 9, not a single six, no hits. Now we roll the remaining nine dice. And one six rolled, so the British cause one hit. So a total of three hits inflicted on the British, one on the Patriots, and battles are won by the side that inflicts more hits on the enemy, so the Patriots win this battle, and the British have to retreat. 
So now we have to uh, inflict the losses on the British side, and no type can suffer two losses until each type suffers one. So that means that the regulars will suffer one loss, the artillery one loss, and the Tories one strength point lost. Now the Patriots assigned their loss to the militia. And that's the end of this battle resolution. The British must retreat. They have to retreat in the direction of their supply sources. They cannot retreat into Kingston because that's the space from which Washington attacked. So they retreat into Stockbridge where the Hessians were located. As you have been able to see, this game uses a bucket of dice combat resolution system to resolve battles and storm attempts against forts. And uh, there are some people who do not like rolling lots and lots of dice. And for that, the designer also included an optional loss calculation table. So you have the alternative of using this table. You locate the column uh, of... Uh, number of dice that each side will roll and you roll just two dice and the result is the loss that one side inflicts on the enemy. In this video uh, I made reference to a player aid card that I made for the game which you can obtain in the file section of this game at BGG. It also includes that optional loss calculation table and also in the file section you can download the cards that I made which summarize the actions that cost leadership points for each of the sides. And here we reach the end of this preview video for Campaigns of 1777 published by Strategy and Tactics magazine and designed by Harold Buchanan. I hope that this video has given you a good idea of the flow of the game and what the game has to offer. This is Stuka Joe, signing off for now. Thanks for watching.